Uh, my name is Peter Stotts. Uh, I live in uh, Austin, Texas. I live on the east side of town, and uh, we've been we have lived here at this home that y'all are staying at for some 15 years. And the reason I reached out to you, or you actually reached out to me, is because you're uh, you're walking through the the home that was uh, that was envisioned by my uh, late wife. And from her drawings that she made at night and would drop on the floor next to her on the sheets of paper. So you just told me a sentence, and I'd like for you to repeat it, and and, and we'll start off with that because I think it really brings up the story. Okay. Uh, my name is Peter Stotts. I uh, live in Austin, Texas, on the east side. Um, we live in a beautiful home on a corner in an area that is going through some transitions and I believe the reason we're speaking is because uh, I witnessed many of these and I'd like to share as much as y'all would like to hear what it would be like to be a moment in time from the the 80s the 70s 80s and the 90s here in East Austin uh, issues of gentrification race relations and then uh, the personal story of the family and then the child's story. So, so tell me the story. How did, how, it is now 2015 and yeah. South by just ended and we're here, yeah. but the story go all the way back. Okay, well I was, uh, the first part of the story is, uh, I was just a, uh, not a ne'er-do-well, but a person who probably could have always done better. And I was going to go to the Yucatan to uh, become enlightened. Um, take that as you will. And then uh, I was working behind the bar, and all of a sudden a girl came walking in, and uh, she's cute, young, fine. But that was it, a waitress. And uh, I took note, and she was clearly had an, uh, an amazing ability to keep all of her dollars straight and her joie de vie and interesting dress flair. And um, nothing, uh, although at that time, not morals were not loose, but it. People did sleep around, whatever, but with this person, I knew that uh, maybe it was, it was, I was already in a good place, so I didn't have to hurry things. So we started seeing each other kind of like parallel play and going out and enjoying each other's company, going to Mexico and uh, I guess becoming more friends and a lot of respect for each other. Uh, this, you know, this can only go so many months because she was very, very pretty and uh it's just kind of, kind of normal. So uh, one day we were sitting outside of my home, and uh, the police pulled up behind us, and they said, "Either you go inside, or you're going to move on." And we couldn't move on because we'd been drinking. So she had to go inside. Well, that's the, the house came tumbling down. Um, lo and behold, uh, she has a lot of good character. She um, taught me uh, honesty. She taught me. Um, oh, honesty was a big one. She could tell right away she had a very, very intuitive um she could tell also maybe i'd give it away too but uh if i was telling the truth or not so that that was a big hurdle to break because i could usually fool most of the world but i didn't get anywhere with her <laughs> um we cohabitated and then she said you know i need to live just with you not with you and your roommate and i said oh we'll never do this she goes let me do it cry so we went to the east side of town which was the, the area of minorities what year was this? Uh, probably around 1980. Okay. And we moved to a Hispanic neighborhood. Hispanic neighborhood, most primarily from Mexico, Mexican Americans. And it's they are very insular and they're very pro family and they're just really ingrained with each other. And we were definitely the outsiders. And we were the first white family there, our first white folks moving in there also. We parked our cars in the front yard like everyone else did. Uh, we ran through the house where there was so much space. Uh, we got to live the bohemian lifestyle. Uh, we had lots of friends, roommates. Everything was good. Um, but I think uh, Anne always knew or has an internal clock. So she always knew that it was kind of time to move towards this. It was time to get our own place. It was time to have less roommates. I didn't see any reason for that. But uh, I deferred after two or three times because uh, I owed her a lot. What I mentioned earlier, she made me a much better person and stuck with me during my low times. So uh, eventually, we, uh, you know, couldn't. We had to find a home. We ended up taking the home for ourselves. 
Uh, she thought it was time then to get married. This was after seven years. Um, a little background story on this is that when I met Anne, we talked a little bit about her family, and uh, she's a very powerful, amazing lady. But um, come two or three weeks in the relationship, she cried for like three days. And I don't hang with people who cry all the time. But she was so out of character that I think it was like a rush of something that had to be released. And it turned out their mom had died at 50 and of cancer and it, it was really brutal uh, they did cobalt this kind of stuff and we did not know who uh, Ruth was her, her name and we did not know where Ruth had come from and but we knew something unusual so we never could get our it was really amorphous couldn't figure out where she came from what her story was no one really knew about her they didn't talk about her because it was cancer so uh, but I had an instant love for this woman because uh, she was my wife's mother, and I didn't relate to the father, so I knew the characters of Spike from the mother. So I, and also the mother started the uh, uh, a legal clinic at Southern Methodist University. She was uh, for to help the indigent. She did all these amazing things before she passed the fifty. So she's quite a lady. She made it in the military. She made it in the medical field. She actually outranked the man she ended up marrying, his father. But it was always kind of a story, like what happened, uh, what happened there, the kids. But anyway, uh, Willa, uh, and it broke down for three hours or you know, a number of days, and uh, it just came and went. And I knew it wasn't her personality, so I knew there was no reason to worry, and I was kind of ha ha happy that she found, I don't know, it was just uh, it was the right thing to do. It wasn't a habitual thing. As you could tell, it was had to happen. So time went on, and uh, so I think I came home from a photo job. I was a photographer, and she said, we're going to get married. And I knew then that there was my time of uh, not playing. I got another reason that she hung with me is I was true. Um, I would I love seeing different people, but uh, I didn't move, mess around for one reason. She would have caught me. And two, it would have been very hurtful. So she kind of wins on that one. And plus she's just had a lot of dignity. So um, we we did get them married. And then uh, the, the child, uh, Cole Stotts, came the firstborn. He was born at home. We did the whole um, home birth that was 1991 and uh, unbeknownst to us that was the year that the, the BRCA gene was first identified as BRCA which runs 99% consistent with Ashkenazi folks and there was always kind of a she always had a kind of a Bulgarian Polish features a little bit uh, we still couldn't put it together but we were with the child so we didn't we weren't following medical news and we'd kind of forgotten about the cancer of her mother a little bit I had I'm sure Aunt had um, so that 1991 came through the history pages you can already see him flipping through and uh, then I was told that we needed a second child and I was told her that we already have a child and she said no that's you have a child to play with the other child so I didn't know any of these things so uh, should we got married had a child, and I had a second child, which was another miracle, Willa. Uh, this is who this is, and this is the picture of Anne and her and young Willa. Um, so we and and Anne by this time had figured that uh, she hit the glass ceiling for a rock and roll. She had been a rock and roll promoter because she she was pretty adroit about numbers and things. But when Rat or a band like uh, the Dead Kidney would come in, they just didn't respect her. So she need and she wasn't very tall. So she knew she made need to make the leap, and her mother was an attorney, so I think uh, it was a wink and a nod between us that Anne would go to law school because she hit a kind of glass ceiling here in, in terms of the male society. So uh, she leaped that, and she's got a, a pure mind. If you look up, if you go to Wikipedia, I believe, and you look under the BRCA gene, and for females, they're like given two traits. One, they're white, blind, brilliant, and they, uh, they are... Uh, challenge at 50. Uh, it's usually terminal. So we kind of did it to flesh out the story a little bit. We kind of figured that uh, Anne's mother somehow lost her mother and then maybe was separated from her father for whatever reason and then Anne's mother's put up for adoption. So that all got lost. And by, so there was no story on her anymore. Then Anne uh, did not know any, any of this, but then she had a premonition about something was going to happen. So I think that she, without ever divulging any of this and without doing any histronics, started making her plan. 
and and it wasn't a mean one, and it was all encompassing. So basically, we were to get uh, get married, have a child, have another child, get a home, and then um, lo and behold, uh, everything was good. So there she was moving into a judgeship, and then she comes home one day and says, um, "You know, they found a lump." This is after we had moved into this home, and a little background on this home that I'd forgotten was that she had basically, Anna basically designed much of the interior of the home that we live in now, uh, where the kids' rooms were going to be, where um, how much space we needed, where the front room was going to be, which just makes us so remarkable that y'all are here now, and you get to walk through all this because it is a bit of a circle. Um, she always was a woman of letters. This group, y'all's group seems to be a people of letters. Um, so, there's, you know, there's a whole lot of, like, things that she would have approved of or was on the same page. So, um, um, the home was built. We were a happy home. She came home with a lump and didn't, didn't again, didn't panic. Um, there may have been a little bit of shoddy medical work. I don't know, you know, for certain. But that's when we found out that she had the BRCA gene, and that's when we did the research. And that's when we found out that that was the time that... Um, she, uh, that was probably from her genetic background that we didn't know much about. So then it was like six years of, um, of therapies and, and uh, the slowly dismantling of a human being. Um, there's no other way to put it. It's, it's really ruthless. It's really hard. It's one of the most aggressive cancers there are. Um, a bit of good news is that uh, since the majority of those cancers are found, are found in Tel Aviv, uh, I've now made it a personal job to follow the research done there and do, do, do research here because um, my daughter now has been tested and she has it. So uh, we have, you know, it was the most important thing in my life before she was tested. And she's very powerful. She's got her mom's abilities, pure breath, you know, pure ability. And she gets to know 30 years before. So, you know, the have the no cigarettes, whatever touch your mouth. Uh, because there is an element of you being able to manipulate things a little bit more. Stress, stay away from stress. You can't activate the internal energies that are at work, negative stuff. So, in that regard, she's going to hold herself to that. And then also, um, she was going to become pre law. Now she's going to go genetic and law. So, you know, in a way, to have this knowledge that Anne didn't have allows us to um, allows her to allows me to uh, be here and to figure out what how we can optimize the situation we're in. And having passed was a, a, trem a tremendous outpouring. We, sh we she was interred, and the last service was here at the church down the street at the Black Church. Reverend Chase, six hundred people showed. Um, she fought for every breath of her life, uh, to, a week before she passed, we were in Marfa, Texas, and she was with her iPhone taking photographs, and I was thinking, who is she going to show these pictures to? Um, you know, so there were, uh, there were some am amazing things we all learned. Uh, the kids, her son and daughter, Cole and Willa, have now had the most difficult time of their life, and they both think that since they made it through that, um, they would probably can handle anything else. So there we are today, and... Uh, with Anne passing, we also left us kind of financially vulnerable. And we've always been people who have reached out to travelers and travel a lot ourselves and to share our home with groups of folks, um, especially ones who respect our, our lifestyle and our things and our us. Uh, it's been a very uh, rich experience for both Cole and Will and myself to um, see other cultures because that's the way we've been raised living in a black now neighborhood, coming from a Hispanic neighborhood, traveling, our honeymoon was in Turkey, so basically, uh, you know, I appreciate you reaching out, and uh, I guess the bottom line is that uh, no one really passes until people quit talking about them, so I want to make certain that uh, I'm very, uh, I'm dutifully mindful of how much she did for all of us, and how many hundreds of hours she spent behind her eyes thinking about how we could make it after she passed she was clearly the leader um, and when you're basically walking around in her vision stuff not happy to be gone trust me but loved us so much that uh,
this is what we were living in. Um, for, first of all, thank you. And, and I do want you to tell the story of the house. Okay. And you said something that really touched me, and it was the fact that you realized that you have to take a risk yes. to make your own life. And that really stuck with me. Um, I well, we found that on a number of occasions. I could talk about risk. Uh, you know, my, uh, the risk that we took. Um, so, so start that story of, of how you came to the neighborhood. Um, well, I guess, again, it was Ann. Um, Ann said, why don't we go to the other side of the freeway? And I said, I've never been on the other side of the freeway. Who lives over there? And, hey, and uh, so we're kind of non-prejudicial. And so we were good, and we just had to wait. But again, we took a risk. We got what? What was the neighborhood? The, the, it was very, very Hispanic, and it was very closed, and it was very poor, and we didn't have any of our P's and Q's, uh, which means that we didn't have any of the decorum down. So we made mistakes on how we treated others. You know, we didn't. We had to soften our stance. We had to realize that we moved into a different culture. So that was a risk to do that. Tell me about that culture. Like, Hispanics I, I are, realized there were, it was a drug area full of drugs. People were drilling, dealing drugs. That was the black neighborhood. That's the one we're moving into now. That, that neighborhood okay. there was alcohol and uh, very close. So they didn't reach out. So they don't make you feel welcome. When Willow was born, that was the first time. It was almost like a scene out of a movie. They got in the processional and came to pay their dues to the family. That's when we were finally accepted is when we had a child. Because that meant that we were here to stay. That was the first time they broke down their rules. And when Ann and I got married, the, uh, the, the whole neighborhood showed up. and We got to drive the drug dealer. We were driven around the drug dealers, Bentley. Uh, so, you know, um, not that we encourage that. But uh, that's we met. What you're probably referring to a little bit is that um, Ann had those rules. Uh, marriage, child, child, own home. Oh no, I knew she liked this neighborhood. I knew that she really liked San Bernard. San Bernard is where Thurgood Marshall lived, uh, stayed. Thurgood, this home here was, was a, a home where, I mean, this lot here was an area where they called the juke, uh, juke joint circuit, where uh, many of the black musicians would come here. You're all the greats. Dizzy Gillespie's, the uh, hoop doos all of them would come on the street. And many of them would stay here at the uh, housing, rooming house that was here. Mrs. Beaver's house that was here and it had burnt down. Um, so I knew she liked the street. I knew that she, it, there's a there's a great dignity in in, in, in in the blacks that have been fortunate enough to go to school. Many of the teachers lived here. Uh, civil rights movement leaders all came from this area here. All these churches, the pastors, and they were under duress. Uh, we knew this area had fallen into disrepair. Once once the races. Uh, combined, then this neighborhood lost some of its identity because some of the uh, businesses left. Uh, people wouldn't spend money in their own community, which kind of made it fall into disrepair. And then we had the great uh, crack cocaine uh, epidemic, which uh, was just horrendous. And it, sh it took years for even the black community to realize how bad and how powerful and how they needed to get get that stuff out of their own system. Don't worry about whites, don't worry about anything else. Like, there were rumors, rumors even that whites were placing the co crack cocaine uh, pandemic on the black community. And this gained much acceptance because it was just so horrible. It was scorched earth. Uh, the one who sang uh, sexual healing or uh, some of the great singers were shot by their own fathers. Uh, Spike Jones, Spike Lee did a movie about that very story where the boy and he's like every realized he's the most amazing singer we've ever heard and his own father had to take him out because he became so rapid with this uh, a lot of the rappers um tupac and all those guys they're also very incredible people but they're all eliminated because of crack cocaine so it was a taken incredible toll when people were in a room and the mother would actually leave the baby to go get a hit um i think the whole it was like apparent that this was almost too powerful so uh that was kind of the way this area was here, but I, the pressure was on Pedro for me to get a place. And so I had struck out so many times trying to get a house around here because every lot here was tied up with uh, uh, with uh, aunts and uncles and kids owned it. And it was just, it was just almost impossible. We got real close. 
And then one day I was driving down the street and uh, there was a 12 foot chain link fence with concertina wire on it, a black tree on it, burned out, and a crow calling or these grackles. And I was going, I was like scared to park my car and I was going, because I had the only car, I had kept the car running. Come in here and uh, and I uh, look at the number and I'm sketching it down and writing it real fast and I do my chore. I was going to get some food on the airport. Came home, I had a for sale sign. And it was an empty lot. And I went, wow, she does Anne has not with me, so she didn't see all the hoop you do here. And so I would go home and tell her I found something. And uh, we lived about a mile from here or less on East Eighth in the Hispanic neighborhood. And uh, I came home and said, I think we found just a lot. So I called them up right away. And Andrew police answered. And I said, Andrew, I said, uh, hi, my name is Peter Stoss. I saw your phone number on the tree and it looks like it's for sale. Is it for sale? And he goes, yes. By this time, I had known to put all my sentences in a row. So I said, hello, who I am, what I'm interested in, is the lot for sale? I knew we had a $35,000 budget from Ann uh, telling me that. And I said, how much is it? And he goes, it's 18400 So I said, well, then, Andrew, can we consider it sold? And I was trying to be civil, trying to be happy. He goes, yes, we can. Can we meet? Sure. I probably forgot a bunch of stuff. But, um uh, he said, fine. So I get off the phone and then, uh, Ann goes, well, uh, what did what he say? I said, we have now bought a, a lot. I listen to mom here on the street. She likes San Bernard leaving out all the other stuff. And, uh, so, uh, she, then she turns to me in a typical way because I've really been making her into a heroine here. She, but she also was kind of a tough because negotiator. She says, uh, well, how come you didn't bargain? <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because apparently Andrew is also a character and he would have uh, not sold it to us had we tried to bargain. If people had approached him and said, well, we'll I'll give you 12 cash and that he would hang up on them and never talk to that person again. So we got lucky. But taking a risk. You bought something, you didn't bargain, you have to know when and when not to, what you're living into. Buying, even putting a bid on a, on a neighborhood like this simply because you figure you're going to make it work. You're going contrarian. So we met, we tied the deal. Um, my sisters and brothers were excited for me because I'd, well, I'd been a bit of a ne'er-do-well. Uh, they all drove in from their cars from Houston, Texas, and everywhere else. They came to this 12-foot fence with concertina wire with the crow and the, <laughs> and the death everywhere. And the people walking around waving uh, towels, which indicated they were carrying. No police, no women, no children here in this area. And uh, to a person, they all got in their cars and they said, listen, uh, Peter's just doing something. But we need to be here to help him because he's moving into an area that he is way over his head and this is never going to work. There's nobody in their right mind would buy this area. And uh, they didn't tell me this. This was all. <laughs> and so we started the slow rebuilding thing. And uh, I think I shared with you that at that time there were maybe 1,500 dealers that were from this corner to 35, which is about two, two and a half miles. And they didn't want to be there anymore that I wanted them to be there. But they had, that's how they made their money, and they were strung out. And uh, it's just, it was a numerical thing at that time. They had their 1500 and we had it was me, basically. And then I had a person maybe who came out here and looked at me who was going to build back in the old neighborhood. And there was one guy by the name of Robbie who worked in the shoeshine store over there who also didn't do drugs. And he was going, Peter Paul, what are you doing? You're getting yourself in trouble. And I said, you know, you know, what the heck. So I started making uh, feelers out and the neighborhood started making feelers back. And they knew in time that it was not a racial thing. It was just a drug thing. And it's just really attrition, attrition. And I think this is the time when crack cocaine was becoming, losing some of its luster. So there was groups of them that were actually starting to, to um, tone down, uh, wanting to get out of it, wanting not to get out of it. David, good morning. Um, so uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was, again, it was a, a group of folks here who were uh, marginalized. This is a no-go zone for the police. All the police stations three miles away. Uh, there were no women in this area. No women. Uh, the elderly were sequestered to their homes. Um, the drugs, that we had a major drug deal uh, dealing going to the store. That food market was not a food market. It was only for the drugs. Everybody pulled in there was doing a drug deal. That house there was not there. It was a indentation in the ground. That was a drug dealing. On the porch next door to me, 
All three of these were complete 24-7 drug dealings, and none of them were dealing with each other. These were all separate, and this is just on the corner. I didn't realize, found out later, I bought the corner. So if somebody came in out of, from out of town, if they got off the plane, they're going on each at the corner. They, that meant that meant Rosewood is San Bernard. So I bought the corner. Um, the good folks, you know, it's a lot of integrity. Uh, we did have some scares. I mean, there's always going to be a rogue in in the group of good folks. There's always going to be one or two who have the racial thing happening or are just losing it. And so we'd lose it. We had some windows broken, but by and large, they were good. Um, we did have a, one group that I mentioned to you came up to us. It was a motley group of about 12, and they were every nationality, sex, non sex, everything all together, age. And they came out and yelled me out from the front porch here and asked me to come out. Who lives in there? I mean, it's just, just textbook. I had to come out. Of course, family doesn't come out. I, I usually d took that upon myself. Um, they probably just went out and did their own. They were probably in there doing their own thing because they were, were used to father going out there and dealing with this. Um, and they're going, who lives there? I said, I do. I said, who else? My wife, Anne, and my kids, Willa and Cole. I said, so this is a family. Yes. And they looked at one another with their heads nodding. So a family lives here. And you had a son, and you married, and those are your kids. Yes, those are our kids. And you could just tell by the expression and by some of the undertones that they had just never, ever seen a family before. They'd never really witnessed a struggle. I mean, everybody struggles, every family struggles, every man and wife and children still struggle, but they'd never seen the, the nuclear unit. I think that's what they call it. Um, and it was just. Uh, it bedazzled them, and I think we got a big, big heart from them that they sent because they were going, you know, he's trying to make it. This is so cool. They'd only seen it on TV. Each one of those folks came from broken homes, and they came from broken homes, and they came from broken homes. They've never experienced. None of, nobody in that group of twelve has ever lived in a house with mother and father and kids. And it was so remote. It's hard to talk about it now because it's not the case anymore. Uh, that was one challenge. Uh, of course, we overbuilt for the neighborhood. Um, we used the designs that Ann took on, the, uh, were laying on the floor. I collected them all after she, we, she did drink wine. She's a, she's a capable woman. Uh, but she would just drop these drawings. And I was like, this is special. So I would save them. And I brought them to Letty the McGarren, who was our architect. And uh, we designed this. And we got the money. And it's a beautiful home. And I now see the advantages of, uh, of living in something new after living in so many old homes. But to tie it into the risk, um, I was telling you, and I, that's why I, I think that y'all are of a certain age, uh, that if you go always follow the routes that are prescribed to you, then uh, it's going to be really hard getting out of that rut, and no one's really going to give you a break. So you're going to have to take some time where people are saying, that'll never work. You're going to have to take some chances financially to get ahead. You have to be frugal. Blah, 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 blah. You have to watch your money. You always have to make one dollar more than, you, than on every transaction that you spent. Boring stuff like that. Um, you have to be blessed. Uh, you have to have good health. Um, but uh, if you go along uh, in society, normally not take a chance on making films, not make a chance on uh, designing an app, your time will pass and you'll, you won't have a chance to. You can't hourly wage your time. Out of a, out of lower middle class or middle class, you know, you you have to do things that are. If you don't take a chance that if the downside is, is going to be your health, that you have to take chances professionally and financially to just, you know, beat the whatever to 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 see a new level. You can't work out of it uh, by with hours and, and salary and. and uh, being dutiful and showing up to work. Basically, you're working for yourself. Everybody works for themselves. No one works for the company. You are your own employee. You are the president of your own company. So when you finish working for the man or the woman, that's when you come home. That's when you really got to work. You know, it's interesting what you do. Now, this is not shared by Ann all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that's the long and short about the, about the risk thing. What is this house now? How do you utilize this? Um, what is it that you do today? Well, like uh, when Ann passed, uh, she, she was an attorney, and I was a photographer. 
uh, I had to shut down my business quite a bit because even in times where Anne was expecting children, I knew I could find a photographer to, to cover for me while I um, was with her for her childbirth. When Anne got cancer, uh, this is a whole new thing, and now her Anne became more important than even my career. So this is the first time that people called, because I'm pretty aggressive business-wise. I wanted every job all the time. I did three weddings per weekend. I think I did 800 weddings all together. So I mean, I was ready to go. I was a workhorse once Anne got me going. But uh, with the, with the illness, there is no reason to leave your um, your mate's side and when she has low white blood cells. So all the weddings in the world can't make you leave for that. You'll take the hit. So that's why I had to ease out of the business. The first time I couldn't do work. When Ann passed, her lawyer's salary disappeared. And... Uh, so and then also the digital photography taking that had gone away so it was a whole new field so the home became a place where i, could, I was the sharing economy the airbnb the home away the, the place for groups of folks to come and spend face time i found that if i go and travel with my friends i'm really annoyed by having to go from motel to motel side of town side of town we spend so much time so i thought this would be a really good place for people to uh, find respite uh, and do more things like this rather than park their car and, uh, and eat together, sleep together, talk together. And this the ROI group was, was so amazing about that. Just a week ago when y'all had the food truck on the driveway and I was thinking in traditional Dutch ways we have different areas to sit at and uh, jo Jail said no, we golf said no we together so we may be uh whatever we are we all these groups so i think that that's it's really good for a home like this you can't it's really difficult to do that in embassy suite so i think that there's a kind of symbiosis and maybe some connections that are being made how long have you been doing this this is the fourth year fourth year and you have a yoga center in the back uh do have a yoga center in the back the the whole property is kind of a, a vision of Again, moving to East, taking the risk. At that time, there were big lots of land to be purchased. Uh, another big, big, big risk. We didn't uh, when we bought this one particular plot for eighteen four. When you open up the back door of the house that we built, there was no backyard. So Anne would tell me, "Well, it'd be nice if we had a backyard for the kids." And you know, it sticks with you if you're uh, if you're the husband, you know. <laughs> you're the partner. So uh, I started talking to the lady next door, and she owned two lots. Another big good story about the risk. I'm glad you prompted this one. Um, and I had was, you know, I live here in the East Austin, and I know I'm not, you know, I see color, but not as much. I'm good with all that, but I was really getting weary doing uh, all the drug stuff. I mean, it was just, it was relentless. I remember that 2000 was still at 600 now. I mean, we were still, it hadn't gotten to where it is right now. And, uh, but I had done all the weddings, and I'd put like 12, 14, 15 thousand dollars in the bank. And uh, we had approached a lady next door, independent of this money. And uh, she says, oh, you know, I'm not really interested. I'd, I'd like to, you seem to be a profit-motivated person, and I'd like to sell to someone who's non-profit-motivated, uh, do good or like that from the library. I, said, I understand. I respect that. So uh, a couple of years go by, and I'm out here gardening in the front, and uh, Betty, Betty Stroud drives up, and she goes, Peter, you showed interested in a lot next door. I said, yeah, I did, Betty. A couple years ago, she goes, well, um, I'm ready to sell. Do you have you know, $12,000 today? I went, I do. And she goes, well, I'm willing to sell the property. And 12000 was all the money I had, uh, all the money we had saved, all the money we had saved. And it was like buying a lotto ticket. Uh, if we had given her the money and not been able to find financing, it would have been gone. So we took all the money we had and we rolled it. I called Ann. And I said, I'm a little different business person than she is. She was the worker and I was the um, risk taker. Um, uh, she, the conversation went like this, you know, and uh, Betty said she's going to sell. She would sell some property. What do you think? She goes, what do you think? And, uh, and I said, what do you think? She goes, what do you think? She goes, we just went back like three or four times. And I just, I guess I didn't hear anything negative about it. She was ready to take the loss because she probably somewhere knew that this was going to happen. Could happen. And I said, okay, let's do it. So... I went and got the check and gave it to Betty again the same day. And somehow uh, the SBA, the Small Business Administration, allowed it to 
fly, you know, and from that day on, that property's kind of paid for itself. Uh, it came with a large structure on it. It had 177 major things wrong with it, the building. Uh, it had bars on the windows, came down that day. I said, the last thing I want is someone to die in my house because of a fire because they can't get out. So, you know, that's been, it's, it's been very wholesome. It's a uh, building is good, fine providing place, and now it's a wellness center. Uh, it's got good bones. So the whole area has been really good. Again, when we moved here, the kids, there was no one of their friends were able to come here. Now there's a magnet school one block away, and uh, this is the place where the kids today, right now, are parking. My, friend, my, my kids and their friends are all using the back parking lots to walk to South by Southwest. So there's many circles that are occurring. Y'all using the driveway for the food truck, them using the park. So uh, there's a lot of good, good came out of that. But that was a very big risk, though, to take all your money and not have any, know what you're doing. You can buy a lotto ticket across the street, scratch a card, or you can save all those dollars and then just throw it at something and you believe in it and make it go, you know. But you need to have that money <laughs> yeah. that day. Can you say that uh, sentence in Dutch? Oh, die geeft wat die leeft. Die geeft wat die heeft is waar dat die leeft. And the reason I was mentioning this to you is because when I walk through y'all's house, um, I hear the real guttural Hebrew. And I'm going, that is just so close to Dutch. It's, it's insane, you know. We're not really using a compliment on the beauty of the Dutch language. <laughs> and it translates as, he who gives what he has is worth, worth that he lives. Um, I think these are uh, slogans that uh, the Dutch folks use to uh, find out if there's maybe been a spy in their uh, midst back in the day when we were occupied. There was another one called uh, Apparently only the Dutch can say that, you know, and it would trip up... Uh, the invaders, and uh, you know, all of a sudden, you know, and they, the underground in Holland is pretty tough. And if you uh, say, "Why don't you tell me what 88 gas stoves is?" and uh, if the guy tripped over it, ooh baby, <laughs> <laughs> ooh baby, <laughs> little tricks that every society has, right? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.